I would ask her to contact my office and I am happy to meet her because it sounds quite a technical issue, but I would be happy to learn more about it and see what we could do. Thank you. Thank you. That ends general questions. I am now moving straight to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Keza Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Keza Dugdale. President Officer, the Forth Road Bridge is more than just a road connecting Fife and Edinburgh. It is a strategic asset that is at the heart of the transport infrastructure for the whole country. Thousands of people rely on it to get to and from their work every day, and businesses depend on it for getting their goods and services to their customers. I know of a shellfish firm in the Highlands worried about the impact of bridge closure on businesses, and another construction firm based in Fife is thousands of pounds out of pocket paying for staff to be put in hotels in other parts of the country because they have deadlines to meet. One business leader this morning told me the top priority was ensuring small businesses can travel freely. On Tuesday, Derek Mackay agreed to authorising small vans to travel along the priority route, which is currently restricted to buses and HGV vehicles. That has not happened yet. Can the First Minister confirm when that change will take place? First Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, can I firstly take this opportunity to again thank the public for their patience and forbearance during what I know is a period of significant disruption for many individuals and for many businesses. Can I also take the opportunity to thank a very wide range of staff who are right now working round the clock to deal with this issue? And let me also restate the absolute determination of me and of this government to do everything that we possibly can to minimise disruption and even more importantly to get the fourth road bridge open again as quickly as possible. Now in terms of the point that Kezia Dugdale raised there have been a number of points uh, raised from a, a wide variety of uh, sources about how we could further improve the travel plan that is in place. Some of those proposals have already been implemented. For example, the priority route that was put in place uh, for buses and for HGVs, that priority has been lifted uh, during the night time period. And we're currently looking at a range of other proposals, including the LGV proposal uh, that Kezia Dugdale has spoken about. I'm sure members will appreciate that what we're trying to do here is take all possible action to minimise as far as possible the disruption that is caused. And in particular, uh, when we look at the priority route, we've got to take care that we get the balance right uh, between sensible uh, restrictions uh, and also not doing things that would deprioritise that route. So we are continuing to look at what flexibilities we can put in place and we will continue, as we have done uh, since this weekend, uh, continue to keep the public fully updated. I, mean, I accept that answer in its entirety, but the First Minister misses the fact that this was a promise the Transport Minister made on Tuesday to small businesses that's not yet been realised. And these are small businesses that are losing business every single day. So when the First Minister says that she needs to focus on minimising disruption, she has to fulfil that promise and act urgently. So I'd ask her to ensure that this measure is put in place at the earliest possible opportunity. Because we need also more than short-term sticking plaster solutions. If this situation has shown us anything, it's that we need a government that doesn't put off essential work in hope of saving some money. Now, there is a new bridge that's coming, and we supported that. And the government is working hard to mitigate emergency transport problems, and we support that too. But for the First Minister to try and sweep everything under the carpet just won't wash. We know the bridge maintenance contract has been privatised by her government and budgets have been slashed by her government. We know the budget for the bridge was cut by 65%. Audit Scotland told us that. That's a cut to the maintenance budget of an ageing but essential asset. Given what has now happened and with the benefit of hindsight, does the First Minister now accept that these budget cuts were wrong? First Minister. No, uh, I don't. Can I just to complete the point? Order. Let me, I, I think the public deserve a proper and full explanation of the situation here. Just to complete the point that Kezia Dugdale raised in her first question, we will consider, continue to consider 
any suggestions that are made about how we improve the travel planning and will implement any changes as quickly as possible. I simply make the point we've got to take care that in opening up the priority route to more vehicles, uh, we don't uh, have the situation where that route ceases Order. to provide the priority transport for the, the vehicles that we initially designated it for. On the other issues, uh, presiding officer, you know, the specific part of the bridge that is being repaired now was not broken back in 2010. Order. The work that was considered in 2010 was prompted by concern about another part of the truss end link, not the part that is now cracked. The work that was considered in 2010 would have been a more extensive repair than was actually required, and it would have completely closed the Forth Road Bridge for a number of weeks. And that is why FETA, not the Scottish Government, but FETA, which of course is made up, was made up of councillors from all parties, decided to do further analysis and propose a more proportionate repair. Now, that more proportionate repair was underway when the current defect was identified. And if I look at uh, the figures, presiding officer, uh, for the year 2010-11, when we have been accused of underfunding maintenance, the grant that was provided to FETA by the Scottish Government was greater in that year than in any of the previous three years. And in the last, the last point I want to make, because Kezia Dugdale started her uh, last question by saying that this government somehow wanted to save money. This, let me pres uh, remind the Chamber and the public presiding officer, is the government that decided to invest in a new fourth replacement crossing. Hardly the hallmark, hardly the hallmark of a government that was trying to save money. And what was Labour's position on a new fourth replacement crossing? Well, James Kelly, Labour's then infrastructure spokesperson, the person who was jumping up and down in this chamber yesterday, complaining that we hadn't fixed a crack five years before the crack actually happened, this is what he said. He said that from the start, the new fourth replacement crossing has been a vanity project for the Scottish Government. It was the Labour benches Order. that wanted to save money on making sure people could continue to travel across the Forth, not this Scottish Government. President, officer, people need to know that they have a government that's determined to learn the lessons of the past, not one, not one more interested in covering its tracks and blaming someone else. Order. Order. Let's hear Ms Dugdale. On Tuesday, Order. on Tuesday, the Transport Minister Derek Mackay told this Parliament there was no link between cancelled repairs in 2010 and the work needed now. On Wednesday, he made the fatal mistake of going on the radio and telling the truth, that they were in fact linked. The public is rapidly losing faith in the Transport Minister's handling of this situation. So we know... So we know that vital maintenance work that would have repaired the damaged area was put off five years ago. Can the First Minister confirm what other works on the bridge have been cancelled or delayed because of a lack of funding? First Minister. Well, Kezia Dugdale can go onto the website and see the published minutes of the 4th Estuary Transport Authority, a body that took decisions about the prioritisation of work on the 4th Bridge entirely independently of the Scottish Government. Our role before, of course, we took over the Order. grant funding was to fund uh, that maintenance programme. But it would have been helpful if Kezia Dugdale had listened to the last answer that I gave her. The specific part of the bridge that is being repaired now was not broken in 2010. According, according to engineers, the fault that is currently being prepared, uh, repaired on the Forth Road Bridge happened within the last few weeks. That is the reality of the situation, and we are now working, as the public have a right to expect us to do, to repair uh, that fault as quickly as possible and get the bridge back open as quickly as possible. And I really do think it is rich 
for Labour to come to this chamber and talk about this government in terms of our commitment to keeping people travelling across the fourth Order. bridge. You know, I've already quoted James Kelly, the infrastructure spokesperson at the time for the Labour Party. Uh, perhaps Kezia Dugdale would also be interested in the views of her former employer, former member of this parliament, Lord George Fouts. What he said... Order! The new fourth... The new fourth Order! The new fourth replacement crossing. Order. Let us hear the First Minister. Order. They don't want to hear this because what Lord George Fouts said. Order. Let us hear the he First Minister. The new fourth replacement crossing as a prestige project which was a total waste of money. That's what he said. Now, I will continue to make sure, presiding officer, that I, the Transport Minister and this government concentrate on minimising disruption that people are suffering right now. We will concentrate on getting this bridge reopened as quickly as possible and we will also concentrate on making sure that the new bridge that this government took the decision to build gets completed on time so that this time next year that new bridge is also open to traffic. Officer, I'm sure the hundreds of people on the 710 from Cowden Beath really valued that answer and they really thought the First Minister was on their side. And the First Minister uh, encouraged me to look at the FETA website. Um, I, I have been on that website. In fact, I've got the minutes in my hand from the October 2013 meeting. They state the Scottish Government's September 2011 spending review resulted in a 58% reduction in the authority's capital funding. And... As a result, a number of capital projects have had to be deferred to beyond 2015. The minutes go on to say that deferral of part or all of these projects does increase the risk to the long-term structural integrity of the bridge. <laughs> Crucially, the Truss End Links work was one of the projects delayed. That's key projects delayed because of SNP government cuts. Short-term decisions made at the expense of the long-term future of an important national asset. So we have budgets cut, privatisation of services and cancelled repairs. Instead of constantly trying to avoid the blame, when will this government accept some responsibility? First Minister. Well, let me repeat. First Minister. Again, the work that was being considered in 2010 was prompted by concern about another part of the Trust End Link, not the part that is now cracked. Now, the opposition criticism... Order. And perhaps people just might want to listen to this. The opposition criticism of the Scottish Government appears to be that five years ago, a body that took decisions independently of the Scottish Government decided not to fix a part of the bridge... Order. ..that decided not to fix a part of the bridge that was not broken a part of the bridge that only became broken in the last few weeks. Well, we might not have had a crystal ball to tell us five years ago that something would become broken five years in the future, but we did have the foresight... Order! We did have the foresight to know that an ageing structure did need replaced. That is why this government took the decision to build a new fourth replacement crossing, a decision that would not have been taken had Labour been in government. There is little doubt about that. But, presiding officer, I think what people in Fife and people affected by this closure want to hear from me today is this. This government is absolutely focused on continuing to do what we have been doing since last Thursday night, making sure that we are minimising as far Order. as possible as far as possible, the disruption that has been caused by this closure, and even more importantly, making sure that we are supporting those who are working right now round the clock to get this bridge reopened. That's what I'll continue to focus on. That's what this government will continue to focus on. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when she'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, Monday. Ruth Davidson. Thank you. I think we should probably take this down in temperature a, a notch. Um, the priority clearly has to be 
to ensure that the bridge is fixed as soon as possible and that these problems are addressed in full. However, I don't think the First Minister can avoid the fact that the budget for the Fourth Road Bridge was hammered in recent years. Now, two weeks ago, the Chancellor announced a significant increase in capital expenditure for Scotland, so the money is there. Can the First Minister make it clear today that when the Finance Secretary unveils his budget next week, cuts to the bridge budget are reversed, and that the Fourth Road Bridge has every penny available to guarantee it stays open for as long as we need it? First Minister. Well, the Deputy First Minister will set out the budget uh, to the Scottish Parliament on Wednesday next week, and people can have an opportunity uh, to scrutinise uh, the decisions this government makes and uh, to do that next Wednesday and as we go through the budget process. Uh, but can I make absolutely clear uh, that our entire focus is on making sure that those working to repair the bridge have all the resources that are needed to get the bridge repaired. We will continue to make sure, as we have done, uh, that we fund uh, repairs and maintenance on the bridge uh, so that the bridge stays open. But we will also continue to make sure that we continue to fund the new bridge that is currently being built so that this time next year we will be celebrating the opening of that bridge to traffic. So that's the priority of this government and we will continue to focus on it 100 per cent. Ms Davidson. Thank you. I mean, I think it's clear that the authorities gambled that the old bridge could be patched up until the new one was opened. And I think we now know that that gamble has failed. Now, in press reports this week, we've seen senior civil engineers say either that the bridge may not open to heavy goods vehicles or that the timetable for repair is unrealistic. And this morning we've had the announcement from Amy that preventative action is now being taken on seven new sites. Now, I hope that the government is right. I hope that the bridge will reopen in early January. But can I ask on behalf of all commuters and businesses, when that bridge does reopen, can the First Minister guarantee it will open to all vehicles? First Minister. Uh, the absolute intention of this government is to have the bridge open uh, for people returning to work in the new year and for that to be a case of the bridge being open as normal to all vehicles that previously travelled over the bridge. Now, that's what we have said all along. It is what we continue to say. Everybody in the chamber will understand and I hope appreciate that, particularly at this time of year, work to a structure like the Fourth Road Bridge is heavily weather dependent. But I uh, last spoke to the senior Amy engineer uh, yesterday and the update that I was given yesterday was that the repairs remain on track. Uh, we are closely monitoring this situation. Uh, we are uh, talking to the engineers on a daily basis to make sure uh, that we continue to be fully updated and any changes uh, to our expectations around the timescale for the repair will be fully communicated to the public uh, in the normal way. But as of this moment in time, uh, I remain of the view that this bridge will reopen again uh, in time for people returning to work in the new year. Question three, will there any to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, matters of importance to people of Scotland. Uh, with all of what we've heard today and over the last week about the various issues about privatisation and capital cuts, the two senior engineers leaving, but also the Transport Minister not being able to explain adequately about the abandoned repair, I think it really does make the point, it really does make the point that we need a thorough inquiry. And that's what people in Fife, I think, are expecting. But it's also, it is also what the First Minister should actively support. But for today, what people care about most is sorting out the travel arrangements, fixing the bridge and preventing it from happening again. The bridge, to be frank, is struggling to cope. So what has the First Minister changed this week with the maintenance and inspection regime to minimise the chance of another major failure on this major transport artery for Scotland? First Minister. Well, the engineers who are working on the bridge, and I spoke to some of them on Tuesday morning when I visited the Transport Control uh, Centre at Queensferry, uh, the engineers who are working on the bridge are, as I think we would expect them to be doing, are taking the opportunity of this work on the bridge to check other parts of the bridge as is appropriate. Uh, but, you know, there are regular, there are uh, a large, large number of parts on this uh, bridge. All of them have their own inspection and maintenance regime uh, around them. This particular part of the bridge that has, according to the advice we've had from engineers, cracked within the last few weeks. Uh, that part of the bridge had a regular maintenance uh, cycle attached to it as well. So we'll continue to make sure, uh, firstly, that we minimise the disruption that people are suffering 
right now, and that's to go back to a point I made earlier on, means that we will continue to listen to representations about how we adapt the travel plan that is in place. Secondly, we'll support those who are working to repair the bridge so that this repair is carried out on time and this bridge opens again to all traffic at the start of the new year. And we'll continue to make sure uh, that the proper maintenance is in place on the bridge and that all critical repairs are funded and take place. Uh, and lastly, of course, as I've said repeatedly, we'll continue to focus on the work of getting the new bridge completed on time and on budget and open to traffic by this time next year. Well, there any... but the, the bridge is under considerable strain, as everybody in this chamber knows. And with this happening just within the last few weeks, she can't be content just to carry on with the old engineering regime. We must have something new, something improved, something different to make the system much more robust. Because we simply, I mean, the, the chaos, the First Minister will have seen it, the chaos within Fife has been quite dramatic and we cannot afford a repeat of this. So can she tell me, what new things is she going to do? What improvement to the inspection regime is she going to order? Because we cannot afford for this to happen again. First Minister. Look, as with FETA before them, Amy has a robust inspection regime in place, which aligns with all industry standards. As I've said, they're taking the opportunity of the work uh, that has been carried out right now to do a health check on the bridge and take the opportunity, if there are any uh, repairs needing to be done, uh, to do those as well. Uh, but I, I, I thought Willie Rennie would probably have been in agreement that what we are and should be focusing on right now is, are the things that I've spoken about. Minimising the disruption to the travelling public, minimising the disruption to businesses who are affected by this closure and making sure that all steps are taken to get the repair to this part of the bridge done as quickly as possible so that the bridge reopens to traffic as quickly as possible. So these are the things we will focus on. That's my responsibility. It's the responsibility of this government to make sure that we take all of those steps. And in terms of and inquiries. The Transport Minister said previously, as I will say uh, again today, it is open to any committee of this Parliament, if it so chooses, to carry out an inquiry into anything it chooses to carry out an inquiry into. Uh, and if a committee chooses to do so, this Government obviously will fully cooperate with that. But, but our focus at the moment, while others uh, on certainly one side of this chamber appear more interested in playing political games. Our focus is on making sure Order. that we act that we act in the best interests of people affected by this closure to minimise disruption and get this bridge reopened. That will be my focus, it will be the focus of this government and we will not be diverted from it. Question number four, Jamidi. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the fiscal framework. First Minister. Uh, Deputy First Minister met with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury on Monday. Uh, this was the fifth meeting since the publication of the Smith Commission report, and it continued detailed discussions on the substantive elements of the fiscal framework that will underpin the financial provisions of the Scotland Bill. In particular, we discussed options for adjusting the Scottish Government's block grant funding as a result of new powers over tax and spending. The First Minister will be aware that Lord Smith has stated that the fiscal framework is fundamentally important to making Scotland's new powers work, while Professor Anton Muscatelli has warned that the method of adjusting the block grant matters greatly for Scotland's economic future and could see Scotland's budget fall by £7 billion over the next decade. Does the First Minister agree, given the importance of the fiscal framework and the serious implications it will have, it is vital that this Parliament speaks with one voice to protect Scotland's future budgets and public services against the clear and present danger that is now posed by the UK Treasury? First Minister. Well, I do think when credible independent voices ranging from the IFS through the principal of Glasgow University to the STUC all raise serious concerns, then all members of this chamber really should take note. 
Professor Muscatelli has put the risk, assessed the risk to our budget posed by what is known as levels deductions eh, as the means of assessing our block grant adjustment eh, at a mammoth £7 billion over 10 years. That, presiding officer, would be simply unacceptable. So yes, I hope that all members of all parties can agree that such a proposal could not conceivably be accepted by this government. That's why we continue to negotiate in good faith for a reasonable agreement that is in the interests of people in Scotland. Jackie Beale. I welcome the First Minister's commitment to stay at the negotiating table. She will be aware, of course, that the Scottish Government has borrowing powers of £304 million this year, with only just three months left in the financial year. Can she tell us whether the borrowing is likely to be through the National Loans Fund, the banks on commercial terms, or through issuing bonds? First Minister. Well, we will make operational decisions on uh, these issues uh, during the year and of course John Swinney will set out uh, his budget for 2016 and 17 when he comes to this chamber uh, next week to do so. I would hope uh, Jackie Bailey uh, will join her colleague uh, Malcolm Chisholm uh, in expressing support for the Scottish Government's position over the negotiations in the fiscal framework. I welcome the comments that Malcolm Chisholm uh, made yesterday accepting that uh, what the Scottish Government is arguing would be the best and most risk-free option for Scotland. So I would hope Jackie Bailey could find it within herself also to support that position. Gavin Brown. So the um, method for calculating VAT will be critical to this framework. Is the First Minister's position that VAT should be calculated according to the place of production or the place of consumption? These are, that is one of the many issues that are under discussion and in all of these issues, whether it's how we calculate VAT, whether it's how we calculate over years to come the deduction to Scotland's block grant or uh, how we uh, take account of set-up costs, what we are arguing for is a settlement that is not somehow unfairly advantageous to Scotland but a settlement that is fair and reasonable to Scotland. So we'll continue to argue we will continue to argue that position across a range of these issues uh, and I hope we get to a position I hope we get to a position where the Scottish Government and the UK Government can agree a deal that allows these new powers to come into effect so that this Scottish Government can get on with using them. Question number five, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government considers there is a gap between its position on climate change and its policy on air passenger duty. First Minister. Uh, no, uh, but we do take these issues very Order. seriously which is why international aviation and shipping is in Scotland's 2009 Climate Change Act, which both uh, Malcolm Chisholm and I voted for. And we encourage other governments uh, to also include shipping and aviation in their own Climate Change Act. However, it's important that we continue to take a balanced approach. Scotland is already punching above our weight in the international effort to tackle climate change, and we're on track to meet our 42% emissions reduction target by 2020. Indeed, the latest Climate Group report, which I helped launch at the Paris Climate Talks this week shows that Scotland has one of the largest drops in emissions of 44 leading regions and states championing action on climate change. Equally, I recognise there are important environmental as well as economic issues uh, when we're considering a reduction to air passenger duty, which is why we're working with environmental groups, amongst others, in developing our legislative proposals. Malcolm, just some... I, I welcome what the First Minister said about climate change uh, in Paris. And, um, Glad that she went there by train, but uh, in this week of all weeks, will she reconsider uh, her proposal to slash air passenger duty? Does she not realise that the research of the Scottish Government itself indicates that it would result in hundreds of thousands more journeys by plane instead of train, that the majority of, this, of these extra journeys would be in the UK, which nullifies the argument she used last week about exports, and that the result will be a big boost to aviation emissions, which are already growing faster than the emissions of any other sector. First Minister. Well, we'll continue to take a balanced approach, uh, an approach that prioritises economic growth, but also uh, takes very seriously our commitments uh, and responsibilities to the environment. And as I said, when I was in Paris on Monday, there was recognition uh, amongst a wide range of other countries, not that Scotland's record is somehow flawless or perfect, but that Scotland was showing international leadership. I think that's something we should all be proud of, and I think it suggests that the Scottish Government should continue to take the balanced approach that we've been taking. Question number six, Rod Campbell. 
Presiding officer, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's plans are to tackle domestic abuse. First Minister. Uh, domestic abuse is completely unacceptable. We must eradicate it from our homes and communities. Uh, we are strengthening the law in this area and we're taking action through record levels of funding. We've committed uh, almost £12 million this year and a further £20 million over three years to support a range of projects uh, to tackle violence against women. Through the Equally Safe strategy, our aim is to prevent and eradicate all violence against women and girls in Scotland. The Joint Strategic Board set up under Equally Safe consists of senior leaders from public and third sector with specialist knowledge of issues of domestic abuse and they are working hand in hand with the Scottish Government to ensure that we can achieve the same. Lord Campbell. First Minister, a consultation on the potential for a specific domestic abuse offence uh, closed in June and an analysis of the response was published in October. Um, recently, the charity Women's Aid Scotland estimate there are 25,000 new cases of domestic abuse a year. The Scottish Social Attitudes Survey on Attitudes to Violence Against Women, published in November, found that there were notable differences in the perception of what was considered very seriously wrong behaviour towards women, depending on the circumstances. Can the First Minister comment on those survey findings? Can she provide an update on the position on potential legislation? First Minister. Uh, oh, yes, I can. I'd firstly, though, like to pay tribute to the work of the Women's Aid Movement and all that they do to support women and children at risk of and experiencing domestic abuse. Uh, I think we've got much to do uh, to end the scourge of domestic abuse and also to change the negative attitudes that drive it. The Social Attitudes Survey uh, that Rod Campbell mentioned makes for really grim reading on some of the attitudes that still exist today in our society. Uh, that said, it also provides a helpful baseline that will in future allow us to evidence the changes we want to make and realise our ambition of eradicating violence against women. And we're working, as I said, with stakeholders through Equally Safe to bring renewed focus in this area. Uh, in terms of the changes to the law, we're making progress. A draft domestic abuse offence was published on the 30th of November and initial feedback from members of the Equally Safe Justice Expert Group on that has been positive. Following further work, a full formal consultation on the draft offence is due to be published by the end of the year. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.